Are you done? Yeah. So good oh. afternoon. Shall I introduce you, Cassie? Just, just real quick, if I may. Sure, so, no uh, yeah, oh, bless you. Uh, it's a pleasure, students and friends of honors, um, uh, faculty, thank you for joining this afternoon for our session with Cassia Wagner. Cassia uh, uh, graduated from our university a, a brief two years ago, and she's now in medical school at the University of Washington, completing an MD PhD. Um, I very much remember her freshman year. Cassia, you might too, when you found a novel virus. <laughs> so we're so glad you're with us and to tell us about your work at the moment, about your path to where you are. Um, students, you can use the chat box box for questions, but you can also answer with um, answer with people. You might want to all mute if you can, except for Cassia. Cassia, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you for doing this for us. Oh, well, thank you so much, Ilsa, and thanks for inviting me to share. Um, this is a lot of fun for me to get to talk about the science. So I really appreciate it. Um, like Ilsa said, I graduated from MSU, and it was actually in 2016. Time has flown, so almost four years ago. Um, and I'm currently an MD-PhD student at the University of Washington, where I work in Dr. Trevor Bedford's lab. And we study the kind of genomic epidemiology of various infectious diseases. Right now we're doing a lot of work on SARS-CoV-2 or the new coronavirus. Um, just so you guys know, SARS-CoV-2 is the virus that causes COVID-19 and I'm gonna be using that terminology a lot throughout the next hour or so. Um, and I guess prior to starting my MD PhD, I worked in Uganda with a small a uh, nonprofit starting a children's medical clinic. So in the Q&A time, I'm super happy to talk about MD-PhD programs or volunteering overseas. I didn't get like a ton of guidance on MD-PhD programs because there's not that, not that many MD-PhDs in Montana. And I would very happy to be super happy to chat about that. Um, I'm just gonna switch over and start sharing my screen so you can see. Just a second. I don't know here, right? Here we go. Share. All right, yeah. So I'm gonna be telling you about how we've used the viral genomes to track the global spread of COVID-19 so far. Um, and so obviously we're in the middle of a global pandemic and it's a pretty big deal. We're on a Zoom call for a reason. I was just looking at the most recent numbers and there's been over 2.8 million infections worldwide and over 196,000 deaths. And in the US, it's, the numbers are 890,000 infections total with over 50,000 deaths. So it's had a pretty tremendous impact both in health, for health reasons and also you know it's tanked the economy. And um, you know we've all been social distancing for the past month. I don't know about you guys, but I have not seen a friend in person in over a month and that's Part as well. Um, but all of these policies are put in place for a reason. And so I want to take a second for you guys to put on your public health hats and think about kind of what are the questions that you would want to know about COVID-19 if you're creating policies. So I thought about this a lot and the questions that I came up with are, you know, when did the virus appear? You know, is this a new virus? you know, that suddenly came out of nowhere, or has it something we've seen for a while and might be less of a problem? Where did the virus come from? How did the virus get here, both to the States, to Montana? Uh, how rapidly does the virus spread? And then, you know, really, when can we resume normal life? When is it safe to go about our day to day? And what I'm really hoping to convince you of today and show you is that phylogenetic trees can help us answer all of these questions. And I'll show you kind of the answers that we've gotten for SARS-CoV-2 or coronavirus. All right, so I think you've probably all seen a phylogenetic tree. This is a phylogenetic tree of cats, you know, because we're all bobcats. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, basically it's a way of showing the ancestry of a virus or of a species. You know, it's a way of showing the evolutionary history of it and understanding how it's connected to other organisms. And well, that's great, and I, but I think a big question that I had when I first joined the lab was how do we actually build these phylogenetic trees? Um, you probably know, sorry, my throat. As you guys probably know, 
all viruses have a replication cycle. That's what they do. They go into people and replicate. And this is a really beautiful and actually very scientifically accurate of the viral replication cycle for SARS-CoV-2. Um, you can see the edge of the, I'm gonna turn the pointer. You can see the edge of the cell right here. Um, and you've got the virus out here, right here. And you've got some viruses that have infected the cell. And inside this uh, vesicle, which is just kind of like a bag, um, you have the viral RNA or the genomes of the virus replicating. And then those genomes are gonna be packaged um, and here and the virus is gonna butt off and go infect another host. And so that's what happens. Someone's infected and they, you know, create millions of copies of the virus. And then some of those millions of copies of the virus will go on and infect someone else and they'll create millions of copies and so on and so forth. And that's how we get transmission chains. And we can show transmission chains kind of represented like this, where you have, you know, one person who gets sick and they're gonna produce a virus that goes on to affect another person. And they're gonna produce a virus that goes on to infect another person and so on and so forth. Um, but every time that the virus is replicating, it can occasionally produce what are called copying errors or mutations. And those are shown here. Um, and so many of those mutations are actually harmful to the virus. They uh, make the virus that can no longer fun function and no longer successfully infect a new host. So those viruses just die out and we don't see them again. Um, but some of those mutations, you know, aren't necessarily harmful. They might not even change the protein structure and, we, and then we see them and they're passed on down to the next generation. And so what that happens is the mutations basically create an ancestral record of a virus's history. And then when we apply like next generation sequencing, we can see those mutations and help us understand where the virus came from. Um, there's something I want to just quickly talk about is I think that when we hear the word mutations, it can sound kind of scary, right? Because, oh man, this virus is mutating. What if it becomes more deadly or more dangerous? Um, but that's not actually really the case, or at this point, we as scientists don't think that has happened for SARS-CoV-2. Um, so, in one year, on average, the virus will add about 25 to 30 mutations across the entire genome. Um, and that can sound like a lot, but the genome is about 30,000 base pairs long. And so that's 25 to 30 single, nu single nucleotide changes in a 30,000 base pair genome, and it doesn't really change anything. So at this point, I don't want you to think of mutations as something that's really changing how the virus functions, but more as a record or an ancestral history of the virus. And so we use next generation sequencing and we get all of these viral sequences out with mutations. And then we can use some really powerful computers and complex statistics to assemble a phylogenetic tree. And so as you can see, all of these viruses share this blue mutation. And so that means that the ancestor of this group of viruses all had the blue mutation. These viruses here all have a yellow mutation so their ancestor also all had that yellow mutation. Um, these viruses have the green mutation, their ancestor had the green mutation. So I hope that you can kind of see how we, this is basically the system that we use to construct phylogenetic trees. Um, it's a little more complex than that, but that should give you the general gist. Um, I just wanna share quick, some quick terminology with you. Cause when you're looking at trees and I want you to understand what I'm talking about. Uh, when you look at the, this side of the tree, you'll see the tips. And those tips represent individual sequences, which are sampled from patients with the virus. And then you have the branches and that shows how those sequences are all connected together. And then you have these points here that are called internal nodes or branch points. And those represent ancestral sequences that we know must have existed in order for these viruses to exist, but we didn't actually sample when we took this um, in our population. So we knew the so it's something that we infer must have existed. And then here on the x-axis, um, this represents time or mutations. And so the x-axis actually really matters. The different lengths of branches will tell you how far apart viruses are in time or in genetic diversity. But the y-axis really doesn't matter. It just shows connections. You know, I could put this branch up here and it would not change at all how we read the tree. So um, what do you think about trees? Don't worry about the Y, but pay attention to the X. 
All right, so here I'm showing a tree and unfortunately this view is flipped. So here's the, here's, you know, looking at time in this direction and looking at connections on this side. Um, but what I want to show you is that we can use trees once they're built to infer traits, um, in this case, location. So I want you to imagine uh, that, so we have sequences here from say an orange country and a blue country. And when you see the change from orange to blue, that would represent an introduction from the orange country into the blue country. So we would see three introductions. But here, we're assuming that um, this is a fully sampled tree. And what happens is that when we're collecting samples of patients in real life, the number of samples we have actually really limits the inferences we can make. So say, for example, we just didn't sample this sequence right here, and we lost this orange sequence. Then we might conclude that actually there'd only been one introduction from the orange country into the blue country. Um, and that would really change what we un how we understand the you know, outbreak to have spread. And say for, or, or say for example, that we did just a really bad job of sequencing or sampling in the orange country. We only ended up with one sequence from the orange country. It could end up looking like the virus was, was introduced from blue into orange. And so there, those, are, those are some like really important caveats to keep in mind when you're looking at phylogenetic trees is that we don't have perfect sampling and you need multiple data points and not just to really come to a conclusion and not just pull totally from the tree. All right, so that's just a basic primer on how we interpret phylogenetic trees and how we use them. I wanna talk a little bit about next strain. And so next strain is a project that is based out of the Bedford lab in Seattle and the Nair lab in Switzerland. And then we have one really important team member who's in New Zealand. And essentially what it is, is it's a website that hosts live phylogenetic trees of a bunch of pathogens around the world, uh, including you know, SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. We currently have over 11,000 full genomes of SARS-CoV-2 um, from 59 countries. And that's really enabled us to track the spread of COVID-19 in real time. And I cannot, I, like, I cannot emphasize enough how amazing a feat this is scientifically that all of these people have been able to, scientists around the world have been able to sequence the full genome so rapidly and share them with the world. And that's something that is, um, we're just really grateful for and our work would not be possible without it. Um, so this is the website here. All of the next images that I'm gonna show you are taken as basically screenshots from the website. Um, and I would encourage you after I'm done talking to go and explore it yourself. It's really interesting and a lot more fun to interact and play with the trees yourself. Um, and so I'd really encourage you to do so. so. All right, so this is the global SARS-CoV-2 tree, tree currently, or as of yesterday, I pulled this yesterday. And as you can see, it looks pretty complex. It's quite, uh, it's quite different from the nice diagrams that I showed you previously. There's a lot going on. And this is actually subsampled. Um, we're only showing a quarter of the sequence data here because if you showed all of it, it would um, be really impossible to understand. Uh, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk you through this tree by time in hopes that you will, by the end of it, will actually get a sense of how this thing has evolved and be able to draw some conclusions from this tree. And along with the tree, we, can, we have a map that shows inferred transmissions from between locations. Um, and as you'll note, uh, we don't have a lot of sequences from South America and Africa. So the dots on this map represent sequences that we have, not case counts. Um, and it's not like these, we don't have any sequences in, uh, from these places. And it's not because those like outbreaks are not important to understand or that they don't matter. It's just that we're really limited um, by the data we have available. All right, so let's start at the very beginning of the tree, looking at um, from December to mid-January here. Um, and I'm choosing to show this view, two different views of the tree. I'm showing it in time view, as well as divergence view. And so time view is like our best estimate of how the virus spread from person to person. Each of these ancestral nodes represents like, okay, this is a person who got sick and they moved on to this person and this person. And that, you know, best guess is made up of mutations as well as location and time information, but it doesn't actually show mutations on it. And so we have divergence view, 
which shows mutations, and that enables us to see how genetically similar viruses are actually to each other. Um, so just looking at this first month and a half, you can see first off that the sequences are pretty much entirely in Asia at this time, with the earliest sequences coming from Wuhan, and that's very consistent with the virus emerging in Wuhan, China. And then when we look at divergence view, you can see that the sequences, um, they're basically all identical to each other, or if not identical, they have one mutation difference or two or maybe three mutation differences, but they're all very, very similar. And so what that said to us is that these viruses are a result of a single introduction event into humans rather than multiple introductions because they're all so similar. And this was a result, you know, we had sequences up in January. And so in January, when we saw this, it made us really concerned that this was a brand new virus that had emerged into humans because all the sequences were so similar. Um, and then, and so currently we're inferring that introduction event to have been between late November and early December, and there's an error range in when that time was, but I mean, all data so far has been very consistent with a late November, early December emergence in Wuhan. All right, so now moving on to mid-January and mid-February of the epidemic, uh, you can see that the viruses are all still mostly purple. Um, so, the, you know, the, and that represents that we still have mostly sequences from Asia in this time period, which is very consistent with mostly Asian transmission uh, from mid-January to mid-February. Uh, but you can also see a few other colors thrown in here. And if I don't say it before, colors represent location. Um, and so these other colors, like this red dot here, or this blue dot here, that represents like a different spark or a different case in another region of the world, pretty much travel associated. But most of these other cases did not start local outbreaks around the world. If we saw a local outbreak, we would see a, another like tree coming off that case, and we don't see that. So this is consistent with mostly Asian transmission at this time. There's two exceptions to that, and the one, is this big Europe plate up here. And so I'm gonna zoom into that. And um, so we don't have any sequences in Europe from this time, but from later sequencing, we're able to see all of these inferred ancestor viruses that existed in Europe, you know, in mid-January to mid-February. And what that says is that even though we didn't really have reported cases in Europe then, it was circulating um, and creating, an, and really creating a big outbreak that was undetected. We also see something similar in Washington. Uh, I think Ilsa might have posted the New York Times article. Next Strain and my boss, Trevor Bedford, has gotten a lot of press because at the end of February, we sequenced a sample and were able to show that that sample was likely directly descended from a previous infection in Washington that had occurred in the middle of January. And so on the tree, um, you should be able to see it's this red sequence, the red, this red dot here. Um, I'm not sure. Um, that's Washington one. That's the very first sample that was taken in like the middle of January. And then we have the next sequence over here. Um, and it's less clear from time view because we have what we think is the sampling bias that's making the colors look purple. And that's just an artifact of sampling. We don't think that's accurate. But when you look at divergence view, you can see that these later viruses in Washington are direct genetic descendants of that initial Washington virus. And the fact that they're from the same location, the samples were less than seven miles apart, really strongly um, suggests to us that these are descendants and that the whole Washington outbreak came from that initial infection in January. All right, so moving on to mid-February to mid-March. This is the region of time when the pandemic just goes crazy um, and explodes globally. Those transmission chains, especially from Europe, all really start to fill out. Um, and you just, and, you, and then they cause spark outbreaks all over the world. So we have the New York outbreak in the United States and it's really, really severe. And that is right here. It's actually descendant mostly from the European outbreak. Um, it's here at the top of the tree. But, um, something that is worth keeping in mind is that in this time period, especially late, like mid to late February, people were still not aware that this was circulating globally. And so behavior was normal, right? 
There was no social distancing going on. Everyone was going to school and going to work as usual. And that really created uh, the ideal environment for this virus to spread. Uh, it's not shown in this view, but we have good data out of Washington that the r not, which is the number of people who are infected for every one person who is sick, um, was most hot, was the highest at the end of February. And that's because behavior was normal and people were not social distancing and it, we had really high contact. And so those conditions combined with the transmission chains that were going on in Europe and the US that we're unaware of just led to this huge global outbreak. And in case that is not clear from the tree, this is the map. It looks crazy. And uh, yeah, that, that's essentially the time period. And so now, now here, I have chosen to show you that entire tree that we looked at the, at the beginning, but I have removed the North American and European sequences in hopes that it'll allow us to see, be able to see sequences from other places and understand how those outbreaks uh, oops, actually impacted the other ones. Um, Sequences from South America are mostly in orange. Sequences from Africa are mostly in yellow. And sequences from Australia and New Zealand are mostly in that light blue with the Asian sequences still being a purple. And so one thing America, the African and the Oce Oceanic sequences are that they're really spread across the tree. And so what that tells me is that the, there were multiple introductions into those regions from around the world. Um, and that it wasn't just like one single person who brought the virus to somewhere. It was, there were many introductions that brought the virus to locations. Um, and then you can also see, uh, even though we don't have very much sequencing from Africa, for example, you can actually see evidence of local transmission chains as shown by these viruses clustering together over time. And it's more obvious in a couple different views, but at this point we see evidence of local transmission in all of those regions sparked primarily from the North American and the European outbreaks. And you can see purple well, and you know this virus originated in Asia, but they were like China especially was primarily like mostly able to control their outbreak and you can see that as these purple sequences die down. But what's now been happening is that there have been introductions back into Asia from other regions of the world um, of current is that this is a really important that we work on this globally because what happens somewhere else um, is going to impact other places. And outside of North America are in gray. And I'm able to color each sequence by different states or provinces. And what I, I want you to hope, I hope you can appreciate is that all of these colors mix together like crazy. Uh, you know, you can kind of see New York up here, but there's also sequences from California. And um, geographic barriers. Um, you know, international and state lines don't really mean anything to it, and it very rapidly moves about. Um, I, this is a clade of viruses, and a clade is just a fancy term for sequences that all share a common ancestor. And you know, for this clade, it originated sometime around the end of February. We're not totally sure of the exact date, but it's sometime in that region. And in just about a month, all of these viruses were descended from it. And so you can see here we have viruses, uh, of some viruses in Washington that are descended from the ancestor, and viruses in Connecticut, and Wisconsin, and Virginia, and Arizona, and Utah, and Illinois. There's a Scottish sequence. There's a Canadian sequence. All of these viruses shared a common ancestor um, not that long ago. For some of them, it's less than two weeks. And what that says, it really, really underscores to me, is just how much mixing is the technical term, just how, how much this virus is spreading across geographic regions. And I think it really highlights the need for a coordinated national response to this. You know, 
states are now starting to open up. Montana is, you know, starting phase one of opening up on Sunday. And I'm concerned that if, like, if this isn't done in a coordinated manner, what's going to happen in one state, it's going to affect, affect what happens in another state. And so I think it's important, um, or in an ideal world, we would be working together on this. Uh, so I hope I've been able to show to you that phylogenetic trees have been really helpful in understanding kind of how the virus spreads. And going transmission. Uh, and so this is some trees that, I, this is a, a, a clade or a part of the tree that I pulled yesterday. And it shows our most recent sequence one of our sequences in the uh, this right here uh, from so now five days later uh, this sample from a patient and now five days later you can see it on this tree which is pretty cool um, but what you can see is this new sequence clusters with other sequences that are also from Wisconsin and so um, it says to us that this person acquired their infection from the local community in Wisconsin and they didn't get it from another place uh, and so, you know, of course, we're all in like shelter in place orders. Of course, their sequence is gonna be from the area because it's probably the only place they've been. But as states start to open up and travel happens more, we can still use phylogenetic trees to see if a sequence is from the community or if it's been, uh, if someone's gotten it by traveling. And I think that's a really helpful role of sequencing and building these trees and just being able to understand how much is actually going on in the community currently or how much is from other places. So, so that is basically what I, that's what I had to share with you for now. Um, I know it's a lot of big words and a lot of pictures that you're not used to looking at. Uh, they can be confusing when you read them at first. So what I hope I've been able to show you is that phylogenetic trees, when you combine them with rapid sequencing and rapid data sharing, um, really have provided a powerful way to track the spread of COVID. Um, and it is able to show you that SARS-CoV-2 emerged as a human disease in Wuhan, China, sometime um, in late November, early December. And then within two and a half months, we had massive transmission chains in Europe and in North America. And by mid-March, we had local outbreaks in every single region of the world. And these transmission chains exhibit extensive, extensive mixing by region. They don't respect you know, state or international borders and we really need a coordinated response on this virus. And hopefully going forward, we can continue to use viral genome sequencing to assess ongoing community transmission and aid in opening policies. So all of this work is done by all of these people, the Nextstream team. I'm a relatively new team member, so I'm not the big person to thank for all of this. Uh, Nextstream has been around as a website since 2017. And I think because it already existed, um, it's the only reason it's been so useful in this pandemic because they're, they're already the pipelines to be able to add data and build these trees. All of our data has been sh shared through GISAID, which is a German nonprofit that allows for scientists to share their data and other scientists are not going to like publish on their data without their permission. And so that's really encouraged open data sharing, which has been really important in order to build the trees. Um, and I know we're going to have some questions now, but I'm also going to post these slides. And if you ever have any questions for me, please reach out via, you know, email or Twitter. Um, I really enjoy talking about this kind of thing. It'd be fun to chat with you. So that's what I have. And uh, yeah, I'd love to answer any questions. Phenomenal, Cassia. I think first we're going to just applaud. But that was outstanding. Beautiful job. Wow. So um, I have not seen any questions in the chat yet, but um, maybe somebody would just like to launch in and maybe just raise your hand if you guys want to turn your cameras on. We can see Michelle, unmute and please ask your question. I heard that it may have come to the U.S. earlier than uh, what you were showing in your graph. Mm -hmm. um, I think they said in California that it might have come earlier. Have you seen or heard or or researched any of that? Yeah, so California just um, reported, I think I went back a couple of cases in um, California in February, which is still really consistent with mostly Asian um, transmission at that time. 
uh, because if, if you remember, we did actually see, there are a few like one-off cases that were travel associated that ended up in, in the United States. That wasn't really a surprising result to us. What we don't necessarily see is we don't see community transmission at this point as a result of those, those Californian um, cases. And we don't know why that is, um, but it's not something that we see from the sequencing. Thank you, Michelle. Anybody else? Can I put the link for the um, slides in the chat? I, I think I might need to check the sharing options on that, but I think it should. Thank Hi, you. Cassia. This is Blake Wiedenheft. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Doing well. Great talk. Thanks a lot for um, sharing your work. It's really impressive. I was just curious. Has, have any of the mutations that you guys are seeing been linked to any sort of phenotypes? Not at this point. Um, that work is still ongoing, but I think preliminary evidence is no. We don't see either phenotypic differences, um, both in terms of kind of like how the virus grows in lab or in clinical severity, but that work is definitely ongoing. It's an important question. Do you, do you think that that's to be expected? And if it hasn't happened yet, why, why not? Um, I think, so I think that, you know, the genome is 30,000 base pairs long and the number of mutations that we're seeing in relation to the size of the genome is, you know, much fewer than that. The virus adds on, on average, it's one mutation every two weeks. So we're estimating there'll be 25 to 30 mutations a year after it emerged. And so that's really not that many. And I think that's the hypothesis of why we don't see any phenotypic change. It doesn't happen you know, later, but at this point, um, that's our understanding. We have a question from Annie Walden. Annie? Yeah, I was just wondering if you could talk about your experience in the MD-PhD program and kind of why you decided to go that route. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, so I, after graduating, I wasn't really sure if I wanted to go into medicine or go into science, but done a lot of research. And um, I was really interested in global health. And so I went to Uganda and I worked with this little nonprofit. And while Oh, there, I spent a lot of medicine is, I just fell in love with medicine and thought it was a really beautiful way to take care of people and to really serve humanity. Um, but I also saw and understood how science can really help people. I talked with a lot of friends about before antiretroviral drugs were available and after in Uganda and hearing their stories, I think it, it just connected for me how the work that's done in the lab can actually be really used to help people. Um, and so, I realized that like both the things I was interested in were, were valuable, but I also realized that I had a comparative advantage um, in doing research that a lot of my Ugandan colleagues who were like a half sheet to hopefully use some of the research to um, we'll see if that actually ends up turning out. That's still my hope and dream. But um, I think that I think that dual degree programs in general, like if, if you want to do both medicine and research, I think dual degree programs are one good option to do that. But there's also other options, and I'd be like pretty happy to talk about that uh, more if you want me to. Cool. Thank you, um, Cassia. We have a great uh, question in the chat box. Brooklyn, would you like to read your question, please? Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, has there any been any work on creating phylogenetic trees of SARS-CoV-2 or any other viruses using sequences of viruses that have been isolated from different species? So could we use this to compare like mutations in like humans versus bats for some viruses or something? Yes, we can. And I was actually hoping I would get this question because we've done that work and I wanted to show that tree. Um, so just a second, let me pull it up for you and I'll screen share again. Thank you. Oh, there's screen share here. All right, so 
this is the tree of all uh, SARS like of like coronaviruses. And so in red, we have SARS CoV 2. And in yellow, we have SARS CoV. Hesia, we can't quite see it yet. Sorry. Oh, okay. Did I not share the screen properly? Oh, I have to hit share. Um, sorry. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, so here's the tree. And in red, we have all the SARS-CoV-2 viruses that are currently causing COVID-19. Um, in yellow, you've got SARS-CoV, which caused the, um, I think it was 2005. This, maybe I'm wrong in my dates in there. But this, the SARS outbreak earlier. And as you can see, they're pretty, they're, they're different, but they're not... Let me switch to view. It'll be easier to see, I think. Oh, oh this isn't show time view. Um, but I guess what you can see, A, you've got the pangolin virus is a potential host, and they're here. And we have a virus from a bat that helps us, that suggests to us that these are, this was likely an introduction from a bat, if not another animal species, um, if that makes sense. Goodness. Another question. Oh, Beatrix, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so you'd mentioned that there were some disparities in the data coming from Africa and South America. Mm -hmm. And I noticed also on the map that there didn't seem to be much flow through Russia. And I was wondering if that um, was also an issue. Yeah, so we don't have we don't have very many sequences from Russia. Um, we've gotten more. We previously had like next to none, and we've gotten more, but it's another region that we don't have a lot of sequences. Um, and Iran has also been an area where we didn't have a lot of sequences. But what's interesting about Iran is that we had a number of cases that were people, the people who had them had, had exp an exposure history in Iran. And we were actually able to see an Iranian clade on the tree even though we didn't have any sequences from there, but because we had sequences from every other, almost every other region in the world where people had been to Iran and we were able to identify kind of what the Iranian, one of the Iranian enclaves is like at least. Cassia, going back to Brooklyn's question, I wonder if, if those mutations that are occurring in different well, in pangolin or bats or whatever different species, if those just reflect um, spontaneous mutations that have been propagated in different species, or if you think that they really reflect different selective pressures in those specific hosts. Cut out. Oh, no. My internet is having a bad day. Can you hear me now? I am switching over. Hello, hello. I feel like the internet might have had some issues. That's okay. I can ask again. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Um, I was just wondering, going back to Brooklyn's question about the virus that comes from these different species, I was wondering if the mutations that distinguish those viruses from the viruses that you're finding in humans, if those are just spontaneous mutations that are being conserved in that particular species, but if they're being conserved under a specific selective pressure that's unique to each of these different species. Kind of like what I was asking before, if these mutations that you're seeing have any different phenotypes, but if say the mutations that you're seeing in bats that are exclusive to bats are there because they're particularly well suited for bats rather than humans or pangolin or so on. I think that there's a very good chance that's the case, to be honest. I don't have the answer that we do. I haven't seen um, much in the liter I haven't seen much in the literature identifying that, but I think that's a good hypothesis, although I'm not sure we know. I think part of the reason that we don't necessarily see phenotypic adaption to humans at this point is because it's just such a new virus to us. Thank you, Cassio and Blake. Um, Atticus, you had a question. Yeah, so I was wondering, <clears throat> like, is this, uh, are these trees being able to be used to like forecast risk and risk into the future and being 
um, being used to inform like policy? Because it seems like they would be very helpful for that, but I'm, I'm, I guess I'm wondering if they are or if there's different areas in the world that are using those more or less. Yeah, so um, I know that in Washington they're being used pretty heavily and in New Zealand and Australia they're very strongly influencing policy. There's actually a lot of phylogeneticists in New Zealand and Australia and you may have read that like they essentially just put, they, they were able to show that most of their initial infections were travel associated based with the trees and are able to just basically shut down their country, go into you know, lockdown for a month and now are potentially able to reopen because they are, as island countries, they can keep their borders closed. Um, in terms of modeling or predicting that's based on these, based on this, uh, they're not based on the phylogenetic trees that we have on next strain, but you can calculate the phylogenetic trees in uh, different ways. Um, some that require a lot more computational power and so don't make sense for the real time up that we do us to infer things like the r naught, which is the number of people who are infected for, you know, every person who's sick, and as well as things like population size. And so these have been used in models, um, not specifically the next strain tree, but other trees uh, with, from other groups. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Like Ellie's got. Ellie, yes. Yes, um, I have a question kind of similar to that, so kind of a follow up. Um, so you said that there is somewhat of an international research database where, um, you know, researchers like yourself and all over the world can kind of look at what people have already been looking at and what people have already found in terms of in terms of the coronavirus. And so I guess I'm just kind of wondering. Um, as far as like the international like collaboration and efforts go for making a vaccine, mm -hmm. like how is this data um, being used internationally or is it more of like an individual effort that everyone's making to come up with a vaccine? Um, yeah, so as far as vaccines go, there's maybe five, I, need to, I haven't looked at it most recently. There's a number of vaccines that are in phase one clinical trials. I mean, there's at least one in the UK in the US as well as in China. And since I last looked, there's been a bunch of other ones that have now come into clinical trials. Um, I think as I understand it, other people might know more, um, but that as many vaccines as we have in clinical trials, but the better, because I don't know, I don't necessarily think it's as coordinated as some of the other stuff is, but I can't speak to that because I'm not in the field. Thank you, Cassia. Cassia, I have a question for you. Um, given your knowledge and having followed the strain of the virus um, and the multiple strains, all of this, what would you say to university administration? How could we keep our students and our faculty and our community safe from this? Oh man, uh, well, yeah. this is like the million dollar question that everyone is wrestling with right now because obviously the the economic impacts of closure. At this point, um, like the US and like Montana, for example, have done a decent job of flattening our curve but the data that we have is that when life goes back to normal, um, it, this quickly spreads again. Uh, so uh, until we have, a, it's a big question because having, you know, a vaccine is still a little ways out and we have to figure out how to live and survive and keep, keep going. Um, in the midst of this novel virus. I think that things like this, online learning is really great because a lot of universities are already set up for online learning. Um, but it's, it's, the, it's the big question. I, we, it'll be interesting to see what happens as places begin to reopen. Um, yeah. Thank you. Paul. Fascinating research, uh, Cassia. I, I have a question uh, for you. As we move forward, like in this fall, we talk about the second wave. And I, I would see where this research you have is, could be so incredibly useful as we determine 
uh, steps to take and, and uh, if you could address that. How, that's, how it's being used? Yeah, or how, how it could be used as we move forward to maybe this um, fall so, or whatever. Yeah, so what's currently going on is we work with a bunch of different public health labs. Um, I think mostly public health labs from almost every single state. And they're all a lot of them are using next strain data that they have from their state and then they're able to include um, kind of more sensitive location metadata that we can't publish online because it would violate HIPAA um, and so it's something that public health agencies are actively using and gearing up to use even more like this next fall um, to better assess local transmission because obviously um, we have to be able to figure out where our infections are and be able to trace them and to isolate them. And um, I know that public health groups at least are, are trying to use the trees as a way to do so. I don't know if, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's kind of my knowledge of it. Hey Carol. Hey. Good to see you Carol. <laughs> Crashing your party. <laughs> Glad you did. It's not a crash at all. Um, Cassia, there's been a lot of articles in the news about um, the antibody testing and uncovering so much asymptomatic spread. Do the trees, what do the trees tell us about asymptomatic carriers or do we know yet? Um, that's a good question. Uh, and sure, they don't think that their best way to assess asymptomatic spread. I think that like serology testing, which is going on, is a better way. Um, when we have enough sequences, you can use that sequence diversity to create all these inferred infections that we know must have existed. And that's how we're able to detect like European being undetected for so long. But it's not necessarily the best way of assessing how much asymptomatic. I know that like my, our lab is saying that there's about 10, 10 to 20 times more um, than case counts, uh, like it, in terms of asymptomatic infection thing is coming out. Cassia, I just have a follow up to Carol's question. Um, do Will individuals build up immunity and will there be people who are kind of immune to this because of plasma tests and so forth? Can you just maybe give us, uh, for me as a lay person, can you just give us some perspective on that? We hope so. Um, it's, this is a brand new virus in humans. And or you can, HIV is a really great example, but that immunity is not protective. And so whether or not SARS-CoV-2 antibodies are protective is an open question um, and an important question. Thank you. Cassio, I think, <laughs> I think we're all a little bit stunned by what we've seen and what, we, what we've heard. It's just been extraordinary. Thank you so much for the time, for the, uh, the preparation in this, and thank you for your permission to post this so that we can uh, view it many times. Uh, do you maybe have some closing remarks, some advice for the students? And I think it's so neat that we have a couple of alumni, Carol and you here, probably a couple more faculty here with us, students across all the years. So um, a little bit of advice, closing remarks that you would like to give? Continue, I would say I encourage you to stay well and to continue to try to find ways to like be yourself and be happy and be curious in the midst of, in the midst of staying home and not seeing friends, um, because I think that those really are the best policies for now. It's the best tool that we have to fight this. And um, in order to do so, we, we just have to, we have to be able to, to do it. So find things that bring you joy. And um, that would be my thoughts, I guess. Thank you very much, Cassia. Thank you all so much for joining us. Here's applause for Cassia. Thank Thanks you. This was a lot of fun. Um, I'm going to double check that link that I posted for the slides and make sure it's sharing. But um, if you guys want to have access to them, I want to make sure that you do. Okay.
Thank you guys so much. That was really cool. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Paige. We all be well. Take good care of yourselves. Be safe. Thank you all for joining. And I know Cassius is going to give us the go ahead in just a sec. Yeah, sorry. Um, no problem. I, I think it's helpful. All right, so th that should be a link that where you guys can take a look at that um, if you want to. Thanks for having me and good to chat with you all. Thanks, Cassio. Be well. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.